I've got lots of quotes, so I won't bore you with them all. But there's one from um, Martin Wolf, who is the chief economics editor of the Financial Times, who in early 2009 said, Today, they are struggling with the deepest recession since the 1930s. A banking system on, a, on government life support and the danger of deflation. How can it have gone so wrong? He then adds, most of us, I was one, thought we had, we had at last found the Holy Grail. Now we know it was a mirage. These, uh, this kind of quote sums up the uh, illusions that the bourgeois economists had prior to 2008. Although there had been a series of economic booms and slumps in capitalism, they thought it was uh, something they could handle. And they never envisaged such a, a deep crisis as in 2008. Not only was it the deepest economic collapse since the 1930s, some say given the scope and the number of countries that are involved, that you could say it was the biggest economic crisis in the history of capitalism. And I don't think we, that's an under-exaggeration. Of course, uh, bourgeois economic thought has become a system whereby they, it's a justification for capitalism. It's not a real scientific analysis of the system. They take bits and pieces. They look at the superficial surface of events in reality, the market mechanisms, and don't penetrate below to look at the fundamental contradictions of capitalism, which obviously they do not wish to explore. Um, that would bring them too close to the theories of Marx in particular, and even the classical bourgeois economists of the uh, early 19th century. Uh, I think probably for the, the overwhelming period um, itself, the dominant bourgeois idea about capitalism is that it was a, a self-correcting mechanism. The market itself would always bring about an equilibrium in capitalism. And uh, how, although there could be partial overproduction in this or that industry, general overproduction was ruled out. And this goes back even to the early classical economists of uh, Jean-Baptiste Say in particular, we came up with the idea of Say's law, that uh, for every purchase there is a sale. This is an automatic thing, that the market itself has a certain rhythm to it, an, an equilibrium to it, and therefore, uh, this would therefore there could not be any generalized crisis of capitalism. There could be this or that, but not a generalized crisis. And that dominated bourgeois thought right up to the present time. In fact, uh, prior to 2007, 2008, you had the efficient market hypotheses, which is the same um, a fancy word for Say's law, that the market would balance things out. Leave it to the market, because that would be the essence of the, uh, uh, the stability of capitalism itself. It's the interference, they said, by governments in particular, and the distortions of the market, which, re which uh, result in, in the problems of capitalism itself. And in other words, these are, the, these are illusions, and they go back a long, long way. and become a justification for capitalism. And also the fact that they, this idea gripped the minds not only of the bourgeois economists, but the politicians, that uh, particularly in the, uh, in the 2000s and the 1990s, they did away as, with as much regulation of capitalism as was possible. It's the epoch of deregulation of the banking system, the financial markets, the independence of the banks, all these uh, things were brought in to free up capitalism, to, un to, un to unleash capitalism, if you like, uh, so that it would work properly. The only thing is that these regulations and these restrictions were brought in in a previous period, particularly since the 1930s, as an attempt to try and rein in the difficulties of capitalism, to try and in some way bring some, some control over the unfettered nature of capitalism, which they believed had, first of all, created the great crisis of 1929, 
1931, which as you know was preceded with a big boom in America of the Roaring Twenties, as it was called. An enormous speculation, not only on land speculation, but also on shares. Shares became the real product of speculation in those years, and they were bought on credit. Uh, you, you didn't have to pay for a share, you put 10% down and you get your shares. As share, share prices are going up, it didn't matter because you could always pay back the loans because the shares would, would cover those loans in the past. Of course, when the share prices collapsed, the whole thing just uh, disintegrated and they were terrified. And Roosevelt in particular came in with a number of, of um, regulatory controls over the excesses. And yet in the 1990s and the 2000s, all these were just bonfired. And uh, in order to uh, restore the real dynamics of capitalism as they, as they saw it. Uh, but this helped as well to um, create this enormous um, boom. There was a boom, a speculative boom, prior to 2008. And we saw that in the subprime market in, in America in particular, but everywhere. Speculation on property became the big, big thing. In Britain, in Spain, America, they really took off. And, uh, of course, uh, this, uh, uh, in all booms, there's illusions of capitalism and how they can uh, always go up and up and up. There's no, uh, no stopping them now. They've, they've uh, suddenly reached this uh, conclusion that if they do things in a certain way, then there's no end to it. And speculation takes, has a life of its own, and they had these uh, financial instruments, as they were called, these derivatives from which uh, uh, debts were carved up, uh, bad debts, good debts, anything you like, carve it up, parcel it up, uh, have the, the royal assent of a, of a credit agency, and they sold, and the riskier they were, the higher the yield. So people, were, so you had these, uh, this was, and this poisoned the whole of the system. It was very toxic, um, but the banks relied on it, the institutions relied on it, and people made millions and billions out of it. As far as they're concerned, that was the, that, that's what capitalism was all about. The driving force of capitalism is the production of profit. It's the production of surplus value. But traditionally, capitalism made profit out of production, out of manufacturing and production, of producing things, selling them, out of the labor of the working class. Uh, but now they wanted to take the easy route. Why bother with production? Just use a financial uh, jiggery-pokery, basically, in order to produce the, these uh, speculative amounts, massive amounts of, of money. And uh, the belief in this idea that this was going to go on and on and on forever. Of course, it's, uh, every uh, upswing uh, leads to a, an eventual crash. And uh, these illusions tend to disappear for a short period of time. Although I could show uh, that they haven't disappeared altogether. They're back in fashion once again. People never learn, as it were. As I think Hegel said, you know, the only thing, people learn, you, know, only thing you learn from history, people don't learn from history which is probably uh, quite correct. I mean, if you look at 2008, it's worth us understanding from a Marxist point of view uh, how we look at it from, from, the, from the view of historical materialism, that we understand that societies, that social economic systems um, arise in society, they develop, and they develop their productive forces, but they also enter a period of decline. This has been the case in uh, very, various social systems, of slavery, of feudalism. Of course, now we're in the, in the epoch of capitalism. And of course, uh, the capitalists do not believe there's going to be a decline. This is the best system since ever and will always be the case. But we understand that, uh, and Marx explained first of all, if you read the Communist Manifesto, that capitalism is far more dynamic than feudalism. In fact, it's a revolutionary system that can only operate on the basis of, of a revolutionary development of the productive forces, the revolutionary development of, of, uh, of, the, of the economy itself. And that's why it uh, began in, in a parochial way, destroyed uh, feudalism, and eventually emerged on a world scale. Such was the, the dynamic of capitalism, which uh, Marx credits the system with. Um, it produces this... Uh, this, uh, this, this Tremendous development of the productive forces on a world scale. And as Marx explained, this is precisely the material basis 
on which a new classless society can be formed. And that, that, was, that was a prere prerequisite for the emancipation and liberation of society. But capitalism um, has, its, um, has a life of its own, and it has a life, yes. Boom and slump has always been with capitalism. There's always been booms and slumps. And um, they cannot be eliminated, and they will exist until capitalism is eliminated. Um, it's a bit like the human body, I suppose, of breathing. When you breathe in and out, the boom and the slump. The breathe. We will breathe when we were born. We breathe when we live, and we will cease to breathe, and when we die. Same with capitalism. It will cease to have a boom and slump cycle when it's eliminated. But up until that that time, it will always be with us. But there's more to a system than just a boom and slump cycle. There's a, a kind of um, how, how can you put it? There's uh, phases in the development of capitalism. You know, you have the phase of the, the um, emergence and development of capitalism in its heyday, which you could see has emerged um, as a world system until it had the, the, the crisis of 1914, of the World War. That was a kind of turning point in the development of capitalism. And you could see that it had, uh, it had gone through a big development, but the World War, the First World War, was an abrupt stop. And in the 1920s and 30s, you have a dif different rhythm of capitalist development. Although there are still booms and slumps, the booms seem to be very shallow, and the slumps far more deeper. That's the general characteristic. You, know, you can only talk about generalities, but that's the, the general feature of this period. The, the period of the First World War until the Second World War, the interwar period, was a period of, a, of an economic downturn for world capitalism. Uh, if you like, it's the capitalist curve of development has now gone on, it was a downward trajectory. And the only way that capitalism could survive, because in reality it should have been overthrown. Capitalism had provided the, the crisis for the working class to move into opposition and revolution from 1917 onwards. And if there'd been a leadership, we know, although we're talking about economics here, but in effect it's a political economy, that the, the capitalist system doesn't die of its own volition. There's no end, you know, final crisis of capitalism. It doesn't exist. Capitalism will always find a way out unless it's overthrown. And the whole basis was that the, the objective conditions to overthrow capitalism existed from 1917 onwards, and it should have been overthrown. But because it wasn't, he was able to find a way out and at devastating cost, that's the whole point. Now the only way that they could resolve this crisis of massive overproduction from 1929-30 and the Depression was a world war. There was no other way of solving it. And the, and the war, world war had the same effect as a slump insofar as it, it destroys physically the means of production. Destroys, the, destroys workers, destroys factories, destroys every, in, everything in its, in its wake. And provides the basis for a material basis for a new recovery, if you want to put it that way. And as, uh, as you're well aware, they know the capitalists like to have nice little phrases. They call themselves this system like based on creative destruction. A very uh, dialectical. They create things at the same time they destroy them. In fact, they have to destroy in order to create. That's the the essence of of, of capitalism. Um, and, the, and the, the impasse of capitalism in that sense, the contradictions of capitalism, because that's the whole base, that it's not a system that is, um, uh, how can I put, put it, uh, is in e constant equilibrium with itself. It's a, a system which is in constant disequilibrium. It's a, a system which is in, 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 uh, in effect in uh, semi-crisis. You can only get out of this by uh, or get out of a crisis by creating new factors for a greater crisis later on. It's a very contradictory system of society. Bas basically because you've got social production and individual appropriation. You know, the mass of the workers produce the wealth, 
Yet the tiny ca capitalists, uh, uh, handful of capitalists, expropriate the wealth. And this is a fundamental contradiction based on the profit motive. Um, so we have booms and slumps which are part and parcel of the equation. They will, they will take place. I mean, uh, the first simultaneous crisis in the post-war period that happened to all countries simultaneously was in 1974-75. That was called the famous uh, uh, oil crisis because uh, of the war in the Middle East, oil prices quadrupled and uh, you had this slump. So the bourgeois economists said, well, it was an oil crisis. It wasn't a crisis of capitalism. Uh, whereas we understood that the, it, was a, it was a crisis of capitalism. There was a crisis of overproduction at that point. Uh, but the, a trigger occurred. In other words, what triggered the crisis? Uh, and that was the increase in oil. But it only was a trigger. The, everything else had to be there before that trigger would work. And the crisis would have come in another form. If it hadn't been for the oil crisis, it would have been something else. Um, and then uh, you had a recovery. In fact, in the United States, I remember the economy increased by 7% in a year. That was quite a big uh, leap forward. Showed it, it dynamically came back in a, in, a, in a big way. But then there was a further economic crisis in 1981. Uh, again, a, quite a deep crisis. Mass unemployment began to appear. Before 1974, there wasn't any mass unemployment. There was very little employ, uh, unemployment. And yet that... Then you're talking a million, then two in Britain, a million, and then later three million unemployed. Uh, what the figure is today, I'm not sure, because they, cov they cover it so much up uh, that you, you, you don't like, actually know what is employment and what is unemployment these, these days. But clearly, there's a lot of people who would well, work in part-time, who would love to work full-time. There's disguised unemployment. People have dropped off the unemployment register for various, been thrown off, basically. There's still millions who are unemployed at the present time. In fact, the TUC estimated there were four and a half million, given these uh, other factors. So it's a, a system that cannot use, although they brag in Britain that, look, we've got um, full employment here, or we, at least we've got more working now than ever before. Uh, they work like bloody slaves, but nevertheless, we've got more people who are working than ever before. And um, they see this as, a, as, a, as the, the dynamics of, of capitalism itself. We'll look at that now uh, in a minute. But after 81, you had another in 1990, 1991. And then you had one in 2000, 2000, 2001, and then 2008, which we're talking about uh, today. And that was one hell of a crisis. And the reason why it was a very deep crisis of capitalism, and, and it began as a financial crisis. In fact, you hear all the time and you, uh, about this crisis, oh, it's a financial crisis, it's a financial crisis, as if that was the only thing. On the contrary, it wasn't simply a financial crisis. It started as a financial crisis, but just like the oil crisis in '74 tipped the, the, the world economic uh, system into a, an economic crisis of overproduction, so this financial crisis simply triggered the deep economic crisis of overproduction that was manifesting itself in the previous period. So, but they, they wrap it on about financial crisis as if that is it. In other words, let's, let's, let's separate out the real economy, very healthy, as they would put it, from the financial economy, which is a bit gone wrong a bit. And therefore, that's where the problem is. That's the fact. And as long as we deal with this little financial problem here, the rest will be fine. That's the implication that capitalism is healthy and so on and so forth. Clearly, um, it, it nevertheless shook the nerves. This crisis uh, shattered, I would say, the nerves of the capitalist class shattered them uh, everywhere because they were terrified that this crisis would manifest, ma manifest itself in another depression, a world depression, like in the 1930s. And that would have been an absolute catastrophe as far as they were concerned. And they were even so worried, you know, the Church of England, uh, as you see here, they, they put on its website a new prayer. Lord God, we live in disturbing days. Across the world, Prices rise, debts increase, banks collapse, jobs are taken away, and fragile security is under threat. Loving God, meet us in our fear and hear our prayer. Amen. Well, that didn't do nobody, nobody good, did it? Thanks very much. But it showed how, how they're kind of desperately looking for anything to try and uh, 
pacify this, the, uh, the specter of, of economic crisis, the devilry of economic crisis on a world scale. In fact, it, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, didn't he, the, uh, the other week, talking about the crisis of capitalism. And the only way that we're going to uh, avoid this crisis is, is a moral dimension. In other words, the capitalists are going to be a bit more moral about it than they're making their profits. And look at this, look at this, uh, this, this, this gulf between rich and poor. Ooh, this is very bad and so on. I mean, uh, this is all the symptoms of capitalism. It's a natural outcome of the capitalist mode of production and profit making. You know, they're trying to scrape away the, the things they don't like to, to, to reveal something they think that, that can work. But they both connected, inseparably connected, as Marx explained, you know, uh, 150 years more ago, that out of free competition will come monopoly. That the uh, inevitable tendencies of capitalism is a greater concentration and centralization of capital. That through competition, they were, the whole object of competition is to defeat your opponents, to swallow them up and uh, create bigger and bigger and bigger banks, bigger and bigger factories, bigger and bigger corporations. And that's what they were writing about, Marx was writing about in, in, in uh, 1848, when uh, there weren't any of these things around. Showed the uh, brilliance of his analysis and understanding of how we have monopoly capitalism at the present time, and imperialism as well, on the basis of the world being carved up by the giant corporations and countries in their own particular interests. But capitalism, uh, yes, it develops, it is born, it develops, it matures, but it also enters into a decline. It reaches old age, it becomes senile uh, and exhausted. And this is what we have to understand. This is the background nature, if you like, of this crisis. The reason why it's so deep, the reason why it's so severe, is that despite the previous 50 years since the war, and after the war they had a big economic upswing, it lasted 25 years, this wasn't a little boom, it was a massive economic upswing of, of the productive forces internationally, and allowed reformism, obviously, to provide reforms. The National Health Service, free, free education, uh, no unemployment, all these things were due to the economic upswing of capitalism and the pressure of the working class demanding those reforms. But they could afford them under those circumstances. Now it's a different kettle of fish insofar as that economic period of upswing lasted 25 years, came to an end in 1974, it is true, but, ca but they were able to try, and they were putting off, it's like something else, you can put off a crisis but the more you put it off, the longer you put it off, the worse it becomes. The contradictions emerge far greater than before. And the big kind of uh, element in the equation prior to 2008 was credit. Credit was freely available. Um, why? Because they had plenty of money to uh, loan out because they weren't investing it into productive industry. What is the essential a justification of capitalism. The historical justification of capitalism is that it, it exploits the working class. That's quite correct. It, it extracts surplus value from the working class through unpaid labor, but it invests that unpaid labor in the development of the productive forces. They have to compete with their competitors. The only way they can compete with their competitors is introduce new techniques, new machinery to increase the productivity of labor. And that can only be done with investment into new machines, new industries, new factories, etc., etc. Uh, and therefore, they can, they can produce far more cheaply, far more effectively, and can undercut their, their future competitors. But they're all doing it. That's the whole problem with it. And therefore, if they all have, the, all have, the, they all have machinery, Someone gets a head start, but the other person gets there, gets there as well, so they cancel it all out. But at the same time, they've increased the productivity of labor. They've increased the potential or the capacity to produce goods, which pour onto the market. A market which they cannot determine. They do not know what the market will hold. And each individual capitalist is there to take a slice, a bigger slice of the market, 
Therefore, they produce to the maximum that the market that they believe can bear. But they all do it. And that's the, the, if you like, the, 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 the boom, if you like, of capitalism, where they are all searching desperately to increase their share of the market itself by increasing the productivity of labor. But that, is, uh, that, that drives society forward. That, that allows us to, 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 to provide the material basis for a new society. This enormous development of the productive forces under capitalism. Of course, it, 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 it's not a, a, a system which uh, works in a balanced way. Uh, it's a, a system that, that works in a contradictory fashion. You know, it can, it's a huge contradiction of being able to... You, 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 you plan production in a factory, it's well planned in a factory, but as soon as the production leaves a the factory, then it, it, it enters a, a no-man's land, if you like, of the market, which Adam Smith talked about, the invisible hand of the market. This, in other words, they, they do not know. Uh, it's a, something that's blind to them. And that, but there is some kind of logic behind it. There is a kind of, where there's, in this madness, there's a logic, there's a pattern to it. Um, a contradictions, if you like, which, which build up and allow um, society not, not just to, to stand still, but to progress, to go forward. But it goes forward on the basis of boom and slump. And the slump itself uh, leads to the, the destructions of values, a destruction of, of physical uh, commodities and so on and so forth, because they've overproduced. Uh, they produce a glut. I don't know, why not bring a few, uh, let's bring Marx into this. He's always very good for a, a, a quote. Um, let me think, let's, let's, let's have a look at a good one here. Yes, um, he, Ricardo, he's attacking David Ricardo, cannot admit that bourgeois mood, mode of production contains within itself a barrier to the free development of the productive forces. A barrier which comes to the surface in crises and in particular in overproduction, the basic phenomena of crisis. And overproduction is a very important aspect. It never existed before. Underproduction existed before, but not overproduction. Overproduction is, uh, uh, is, is manifest only under capitalist society. And it's because of the blind forces of the market that the, the, the impulse of capitalism is to produce for, to the maximum the problem is that the market, which is made up of consumers on the one hand and of capitalists who want to buy extra industry, these are the consumers of society, have a limited amount of purchasing power. And the reason for that, as Marx explained, is that the working class gets in wages uh, insufficient to buy back the full value that it produces. Um, and obviously, uh, what the, the, the worker has sold is not labor. What the worker has sold is the ability to work, labor power. And this labor power is unlike any other commodity which has been sold, as it produces greater values than its own value. So although the wages cover the, the, uh, the value of, of, uh, of the worker's ability to work, uh, this uh, ability, when it's ha in the hands of a capitalist, uh, puts it together with raw materials and machines, and they produced commodities, which is the, uh, in which this surplus <coughs> uh, value is contained. And the way it is uh, uh, realized is that the commodities are sold. The capitalists can produce as many commodities as they like, and they've got to sell them. Otherwise, it's no good. You know, but if they sell their commodities, they unlock the surplus value contained in the commodities produced by the working class. And that's where profit comes from, the unpaid labor of the working class. But the reason why capitalism doesn't enter a, a crisis from the word go, day one, hang on a minute, you know, I'm only going to pay the workers a wage that's not sufficient to buy back all of the goods they create. Why isn't capitalism gone into crisis on, the, on day one? Should do. And the reason why it doesn't is the little secret there that the capitalists take the surplus extracted from the labor of the working class and invest it. The capitalism creates its own market 
in that uh, sense. And it's the, what Marx explained, the division between two big sectors of the economy. Um, that is de Department 1, he calls it, and Department uh, 2, uh, uh, production of the means of consumption and production of the means of production. In other words, consumer goods and capital goods, the two big sectors of the economy, and they intellect. Those workers in the, working for the uh, consumer industries buy consumer goods. Those workers who are involved in the capital industries have also to buy consumer goods. Those capitalists in the consumer industry have to buy capital goods, and so do the capitalists in the capital industry. So it's a kind of in interconnection of both sectors of this economy, which allows them to create this market and sustain capitalism. So there's no crisis on day one. They put it off. It's a stage, it's growing, there's a boom, it's a development. But there comes a stage, there comes a point when a crisis occurs because the, uh, the, this uh, capacity to create, which is building up all the time, because you're in competition with other capitalists, you're introducing new technology, you're squeezing the workers ever more to produce more goods, eventually um, the, the market c collides with the production itself and you have a... a, a a crisis of overproduction, which is periodic, it's the boom and slump. What we have now, though, is not simply a boom and a slump. We have what we call an organic crisis of capitalism, which is fundamentally different. If it was just a boom and slump, well, I'll be it, then boom and slump, it'll go on forever. This is not going to go on forever in that sense, because it's reached a... Uh, uh, a crisis inherent within the system of society, that capitalism has become a barrier to itself in, one, in, in that regard. And that's illustrated by what happened prior to 2007. They call it financialization, I think they call it. There's a, a kind of buzzword where um, finances, money-making, speculation, derivatives, all these, this financial kind of... Uh, even they didn't know what the hell was going on. Uh, they, you know, they, they made these... Uh, 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 with it, debt obligations and all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful names they give it, uh, which are financial instruments that they sold on. And we're making lots of money because the risks involved of debt. I mean, who the hell would buy debt? It's obviously they, and to make money out of debt and risky debt. I mean, the whole thing becomes uh, bizarre. The reason why is that they're looking for uh, avenues of profit making which are greater profitability there than in simply building a factory, uh, laying down its foundations, building, getting machines in, and employing workers to produce commodities, and then go to a market and sell you commodities. And that might take out, that's the traditional way, if you like, that capitalism has developed the economy. That's uh, manufacturing, industrial production. Whereas finance has always been an auxiliary to that. In, in the past, banking and so on, is it plays a very important role in oil, oiling the, um, uh, the wheels of capitalism. But now it's no longer oiling the wheels of capitalism, it's become a bloody big wheel itself. And it's an adjunct to the, the system itself. Like, it's like, a, in effect, a cancerous growth on capitalism. It's, um, it doesn't produce new uh, uh, value, it sucks the value from the rest of the economy, this financialization. And because, uh, you, you know, we know profit, well, it's not just profit, it's like the, three, the trinity, isn't it? You know? uh, rent, interest, and profit. Surplus value is not simply industrial profit. Surplus value of the, of the working class is divided between other sections of the capitalists who are not directly involved in production. The, the landlords, rent has to be paid to the landlords. Secondly, uh, uh, money has to be borrowed as well in order to facilitate production and so on. That's the, that's the bankers, they get interest uh, from the capitalists. The capitalists make the profit, but they have to share the profit with the other elements of the capitalist class, the elements of the ruling class. So you've got this rent, interest, and profit. But it's the, the industrial profit which really is where the, the, the surplus value is created in production. That's the whole point. Uh, but they have to share this in the other sectors of the economy. But these other sectors, because of the... the uh, senile decay of capitalism, that's the point about it. You have not only monopolies, but banks and finances have grown enormously powerful in the, in the situation, in a parasitic way, that's the whole point uh, to understand. The huge parasites on, on the back of industrial capital, 
But that's the way the system has uh, developed. And because it hasn't been overthrown, this is what, what's happened. This is the peculiar, you know, developed evolution of the system itself. But it makes it more unstable under those circumstances because, um, you know, financial crises can, can happen far quicker, far more deeply, and have a bigger effect than they did previously. If finance was a small sector, well, you can have a crisis there, but yeah, this is just a small sector. But if finance is integral to the whole uh, system, then a financial crisis can, can trigger the whole um, enterprise into a crisis. And that's precisely what happened in 2007, 2008. You had a financial crisis, there's runs in the bank, uh, was it uh, Northern Rock, just as well, I took my money out just before I did it. Uh, the biggest uh, the, the, the run in the bank, uh, the only run in the bank actually since uh, for 144 years in Britain. You know, that's quite a long, uh, long time. In America, of course, you had the, 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 uh, the collapse of uh, Bear Stearns and uh, uh, also the, well, the whole financial structure in America was that much, much more developed. And they were forced to go f far further to bail out capitalism in America, bail out the banks, nationalize sectors of the economy. Uh, was it Fannie Mae and, and uh, uh, what's the other one? <coughs> Freddie Mac. Mac. They uh, were taken in, nationalized. They were nationalized. In fact, the Chinese had a bit of a laugh. They said, uh, this is uh, <coughs> socialism with American characteristics. I think they said, uh, that's a bit of a joke. <coughs> and even Gordon Brown, uh, uh, you know, had intervened and, uh, you know, taken over Northern Rock and, uh, you know, Lloyd's and all the rest of it. And uh, he said, there's some, some right-wing... Uh, uh, MP, a bit of a dickhead, he said that oh, he's, take, he's, he's taking more action against capitalism than uh, Lenin did in 1917, which is, a, I think Lenin, Lenin was trying to overthrow it and, and Gordon Brown was trying to save it. There was a bit of a difference, but there were. Um, uh, but he had all these quirks, you know, the, the, you know impl implementing finally the 1983 manifesto and stuff like that. But they were trying to, they, save it, they were saving capitalism, bailing it out. They were in, even now they admit they, were in, they, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know where this was going. And um, they, how did they do it? Well, they, 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 they reduced interest rates to zero. They reduced interest rates to negative interest rates. You had the lowest interest rates, according to Blanche Flower, from the, who was then the, the Monetary Committee of the Bank of England, for 5,000 years, he said. That was, was a bit of a, I thought it was an exaggeration, but 5,000 years. Huge, huge uh, measures were taken. Quantitative easing. easing. No one knew what the quantitative easing was giving money to the financial institutions, the bank. In America, it was 85 billion uh, a, a, a month, wasn't it? In, in, in Europe, it was so almost as, as much as that. I mean, incredible amounts of money handing over to bail the system out, to keep the fluidity. And even then, the recovery didn't happen. That was the joke about it. They, they did everything. The only thing that saved capitalism was probably the Chinese. Because they... Uh, uh, immediately uh, uh, give rise to a, an expansion, a speculative expansion, and 10% of their economy was, was spent on uh, a new uh, stimulus package, which could kind of stabilize things a bit. I mean, you had a huge collapse in, in, in uh, industrial production, a third collapse, you know, collapse by a third in world trade. Um, people were put on short time working, factories were being closed down. It was a big effect in the working class, but they were terrified. This was the beginning, and it was. You look at them, I haven't got time to, to quote them now, because we're running out of time. But the, the actual um, graph of decline in the first uh, uh, six months and 12 months was mir mirroring that of 1929-31. They were terrified that this was it, that there's going to be a depression. That be and the only thing that saved them was this huge wall of money they were prepared to pour in you know, in order to save the banking system and reduce interest rates to below zero for eight years, man. <laughs> you know, if it, was a, if it was like six months or nine months or 12 months, uh, you know, that was a, that's a short-term emergency measure. They kept it going when there's supposed to be a boom. There was a recovery, inverted commas, and it was a very weak one. It's the weakest recovery in history, but they kept it going because of the low interest rates because of this amount of cash being poured into the system, where did they get the cash from? The government, where did the government get it? From the austerity that we had to pay. To pay. That's, the, that's the loop. Of course, they cut in the work, they've cut the living standards of the working class. You cut the living standards of the workers, you will cut the market of capitalism. So, so they're in the doldrums all the way along 
the line. Because whatever they do, they make a contradiction for themselves. And although they can push, push, the, boat, push the boat out a bit further, inevitably, you're going to reach a, a brick wall. And that's what they're doing at the present time. They're worried now. The biggest worry is, not is there going to be another slump? They recognize there's going to be another slump. Uh, the Financial Times, The Economist, you name it, they recognize there's going to be a slump pretty soon. Um, they can't avoid it, but what they're worried about is how deep would the slump be? And what measures can they, have they got in order to slow the slump down or make it um, uh, less uh, effective, less, less, uh, yeah, less of an effect? And they look down and think, Christ, we haven't got anything. We've used it all up. You know, America is too stopped the uh, stop the bailout. All right, then they're the only ones who have. The Europeans are still continue it. The J Japanese are still continue it. There's a slowdown now in Europe. There's a slowdown in China. It's not a very good economic situation. There's n negative interest rates for for, mass for the for most of the world, apart from um, uh, the USA, and that's going to create problems because they put interest rates up in the United States when interest rates are low everywhere else. You increase the value of the, of the dollar, which is happening now, and then you've got economies which rely on the dollar, these emerging economies in particular, and they got, they have been throttled because their debts are denominated in dollars. And if there's a rise in the value of the dollar, the actual burden of the debt they've got gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So, these, so it's okay for us, like, but the, the knock-on effect is enormous for those uh, countries that, that rely on the dollar, which is a lot of countries. And uh, we've seen it already in Argentina, we've seen it in Turkey, we've seen it in Mexico. All these things are starting to rumble now. And there's going to be a general slowdown in, in these emerging, not emerging, they're declining in, in, in effect, uh, uh, economies as we've seen. But this is the, the picture as they head towards this new uh, economic uh, slump. It's like as Trotsky tobogganing with your eyes closed towards disaster because that's the only, yeah, but because they have no means. And they, everyone, Martin Wolf in the, in the Financial Times, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We haven't got anywhere to go. What are we gonna? They're all kind of panicking. We should do this. We should do that. The only problem is they're not going to do it. They can't do it. And they even say the political will is not there as well because obviously they, what we've got now is possible trade war um, on the cards because uh, obviously. Um, Trump has made it clear that trade war is a, a great, a wonderful thing. Well, uh, I don't know what he brought up like, but uh, clearly a trade war would have a colossal impact on the world economy and would result in beggar thy neighbor policies because all you would have different restrictions being put, imposed, tariffs being imposed on different countries. And we haven't got a slump yet. So when the slump comes, you can imagine this, they'll rush to protect their industries. That's what, that's what will happen in America. They'll do the same in China. They'll do the same in Europe. And the whole thing has a knock-on effect as in the 1930s. And therefore, this, the 2008 slump was a little foretaste of the crisis period that we've entered because it's not a crisis period. It's an organic crisis that the system has exhausted itself. It is senile. It is an, it's death agony to, to quote uh, Trotsky. Of course, it's not, it won't uh, die a death and then uh, that's the end of it. It won't. It will always find a way out. And it will always find a way at the expense of the working class. You can always do that. It can destroy the productive forces in, in a way that you've not seen. But for them, they, they can't do it as they did in 1939. They can't have a world war. That's the problem. They got rid of it uh, quite effectively, destroying it. But if world war is ruled out, which it is, because you can only have nuclear war, and even the, you know, the, the capitalists are not stupid. They, can't, they don't want to destroy the, you know, the goose that lays the golden egg. You know, you destroy, destroy the productive forces completely. That's it. So they, don't want, they won't want a nuclear war, clearly, but they can't have a conventional war either. So they're stuck with this massive overproduction that will, if you like, will, will um, just impact itself internally on society. And you'll have, in my opinion, huge economic uh, crisis within uh, the, uh, the West and America and everywhere else. It'll imp impact e everywhere, as, the, as the, the last crisis didn't do in that way. And uh, 
they won't be able to do anything uh, about that. They can <laughs> quantitatively, that's, you know, it's, it's like pouring water on a hot stove. It'll, it'll just evaporate. Um, the only way they can do it is destroy. The only way capitalism can get rid of it is destroy the productive forces. That's mass unemployment, closing the factories, destroying uh, industry, destroying the val The values will go up in smoke, all these, the stock exchange, and that'll just, uh, you know, lose thousands and thousands of points. And they'll, that'll disappear overnight. It's fictitious capital anyway in, in, the, in the main. Um, but nevertheless, the, the real productive forces will be destroyed, or they will attempt to destroy them. They tried to do it in the past, by the way, and I'll, I'll sum up in a minute. And they haven't done it very effectively. They call it um, zombie capitalism. Why, why zombie capitalism? Well, it's half alive and half dead. Because interest rates are so low, they can, get, they can actually sur they can survive. So the, because the real means that capitalism can destroy or undermine a crisis or get rid of a crisis is to destroy the productive forces which gives rise to overproduction. If those productive forces are limping along, and you haven't destroyed them, then obviously the recovery, which you've seen, is going to be very, very weak. And that's precisely what you've had. A very, very weak, historically weak recovery. And our new crash, a possible depression on the basis of a world war, bloody hell, this is going to be one hell of a ride for uh, workers everywhere. And any illusions that some people had, despite the Church of England having a prayer and all the rest, they didn't want a bloody prayer to get out of that one. Uh, but the working class will be affected in, in such a way as it will provoke them to look for fundamental change in society. And there will not be any Ill the illusions that are there before will be undermined and destroyed. And uh, you know, as we said, the crisis of capitalism is a crisis of reformism. The idea we can, you know, change society bit by bit. It'll have a revolutionizing, in my, my opinion, on the advanced sections of the working class and the youth. They'll be uh, radicalized. This. This, isn't, this is not uh, because, oh, isn't it great to have a recession? Isn't it great to have a slump? It's what is coming. We just tell the truth about the situation and also show the impact it's have. If the workers don't overthrow capitalism, then it will survive a terrible cost to them and their families. It'll get out of it in a certain, in certain way. Uh, only just to provide, only to prov to to uh, give way to another crisis. So in effect, um, what we got here is permanent crisis. I mean, the working class don't believe there's a boom. They don't. Uh, they don't believe the, this is wonderful. It's a permanent crisis, and therefore that shows the uh, the, the senile uh, decay of capitalism. It shows the system has exhausted itself completely. This is not just a cyclical crisis. This is a crisis which is endemic to the capitalist system that they cannot get out of and will mean a, a huge, therefore, offensive against the working class itself. There's no other two ways about it. So this is going to be a product of also a, of great class struggle. And uh, revolutionary events will be on the order of the gay under those uh, circumstances. And you read the, the bourgeois uh, kind of commentators, they haven't got a clue. They have no idea. And... Uh, well, that shows the, the shallowness of their, their, their thinking anyway. But we, as Marxists, have to understand and explain patiently what is coming in the Labour Party, amongst the youth and the trade unions, and to say that, that we cannot tolerate a slump. We cannot tolerate these attacks. And there's the, the need, therefore, to overthrow capitalism, because if we can overthrow it, the productive potential that's created will, will provide us with a world of enormous prosperity, enormous abundance that we can't imagine. So that's the, the prize, if you like, of, uh, of the abolition of capitalism and the development of a world socialist order. Thank you.